Okay, so we'll, we'll get started just in the interest of time. I'd like to begin uh, by acknowledging that the land on which community makes work and that nourishes our collective efforts at social justice is the traditional ancestral unceded and occupied territories of the Musqueam people. My name is John Paul Katongo. I am a postdoctoral research fellow and incoming faculty member in, in the educational leadership stream in the Institute for Gender, Race, Sexuality, and Social Justice. It is my honor and privilege to welcome you to the Institute's Noted Scholars Lecture Series. Before I begin um, introducing our speaker today, I have some thank yous to dole out. Uh, thank you to Green College for hosting us in, uh, at this magnificent space. Uh, thank you to Dr. Mary Bryson for spearheading the effort and getting the ball rolling to get our speaker to visit us today. Thank you to Tak Bandal, Carmen Raduk, and Wynne Archibald for helping put together our Noted Scholars Lecture Series. And thank you particularly to Jen Sung, our unsung, or well, sung, <laughs> um, our communications outreach and community liaison um, for liaising with our speakers, booking rooms, and making sure that flights, ground transportation, and accommodations are ironed out. Uh, to borrow uh, from the divine Miss Anne, that's Ben Midler for the non queers uh, These folks are the wind beneath our collective wings at the, the GRSJ. Um, he's on gay. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to make sure that their labor and their efforts uh, are recognized and appreciated. So thank you, folks. Um, <laughs> today's speaker is one of my personal academic heroes, Dr. Martin Manolan Sandefour. Martin joins us from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign where he is Associate Professor of Anthropology and Asian American Studies and a Conrad uh, Professorial Humanities Scholar. Along with his many journal articles, book chapters, and editorials, he is also editor or co-editor of Eating Asian America, a Food Studies Reader, 2013, Queer Globalizations, Citizenship, and the Aftermath of Colonialism, 2002, and Cultural Compass, Ethnographic Explorations of Asian America, 2008. Martin is perhaps best known for his um, perhaps best known for his groundbreaking 2003 book *Global Divas: Filipino Gay Men in the Diaspora*, published by the Duke University Press and winner of the Ruth Benedict Prize. I first encountered *Global Divas* as a wee undergrad up the mountain in the suburbs of Vancouver at SFU over a decade ago. A welcome respite from the whiteness and heteronormativity of much of the undergraduate curriculum in my fields of study. Global Divas was the first piece of scholarship where I first saw myself as a queer diasporic Filipino reflected with sophistication in any scholarly writing. And I, am, and I am not alone in my assessment. That Global Divas was a gateway drug and inspiration for many queer Filipinos <laughs> and Filipinos in the academy. At the first conference on Filipino-Canadian sexualities that was organized by Dr. Robert Diaz at OCAP University earlier this year, Martin was the final keynote speaker. Tasked with introducing Martin, University of Toronto English professor, Dr. Denise Cruz noted one unsurprising, but nevertheless remarkable observation, that every single speaker at the conference cited Martin's work in one way, shape, or form. A testament to the space his work has opened up for those of us who work at the intersections of transnationalism and diaspora studies, sexuality studies, and critical and ethnic studies. Simply put, Global Divas inaugurated Martin as one of the fairy godparents of queer of color theorizing. <laughs> Just a fairy. Martin's capacity to open up space for sexually and ethno-racially minoritized scholars is not confined to a scholarship. Many, myself included, have benefited from Martin's generous mentorship, whether during breaks at conferences and restaurants while sharing meals, over email, or at the karaoke bar. In recognition of his mentorship to countless scholars, he was awarded the Excellence in Mentorship Award in 2014 um, by the Association for Asian American Studies. There's much more to say about Martin, but for now, let me say that as that it is exciting that he is speaking on his current ethnographic book project, 
on mess, fabulosity, domesticity, and undocumented minor lives. The title of this talk, Fabulosity in All Capital Letters, is also an apt descriptor of Martin, the scholar and the mentor. Folks, let's give a warm welcome to the fabulous Dr. Martin. Thank you, Dr. Katungal. Uh, <laughs> it is a fabulous time, and I hopefully it will be a fabulous um, uh, hour, if you will. Um, it's a fabulous time for Canada, from what I hear, for most people. <laughs> I, uh, I like my two seatmates and uh, uh, my trip from Phoenix to Vancouver, who said it's a sad day for Canada. <laughs> I, I opened up by saying, well, what do you think? my big mouth and they said very sad day <laughs> and so I said okay but it was unlike most of my Facebook friends um, in Canada who were celebrating if you will and um, sharing those uh, beefcake pictures <laughs> <laughs> which I then shared with people in the Philippines who kept saying who is that <laughs> Who? I was like, a rocker? I said, Canadians have it better, what can I say? <laughs> um, so I'd like to thank Mary and, and, um, and JP uh, and, and Jen for uh, arranging this and all the other units um, responsible. Um, I, I think of this time as a, a moment of sharing uh, right before I send off the manuscript. So I, it's actually a, a very open uh, kind of moment for me to listen and not just to, to talk, right? So please, I welcome your, your questions. I will try to speak for 35 minutes and, and JP will keep me time. Uh, and so you can enjoy both the pizza and the, the afternoon. Uh, and and I, I tend to grow, drone on, so. So my presentation today, as JP was saying, is part of a, a book that I'm writing called Queer Dwellings. It's a project that's about the ethics and aesthetics of inhabitation of six queer uh, working class undocumented immigrants who live together in a small one bedroom apartment in Queens, um, the, borough of, the borough of Queens. Uh, in New York City. It's in a neighborhood called Jackson Heights, which is an immigrant neighborhood. That I'll very briefly describe to you. Now, using ethnography, interviews, and, and um, other uh, theoretical maneuvers, what the project does is to document and analyze the bodily productions of queer selfhood and collectivity in the midst of squalor, exclusions, and isolation, particularly as these people deploy their sensorial and bodily techniques in worldly, uh, to worldly situations. This presentation, as the first part kind of um, dwells on, if you will, is on, uh, based on a formulation of queer as mess, um, and queering as a process of messing, up, messing or fucking up. I apologize again for the time, uh, limited time, I will do a more schematic presentation. And ethnography is n never done justice in, very, in short lectures or short essays. So there's a way in which the ethnographic richness will not be, um, be possible to convey um, in the short time I will be presenting. So I will be dissecting mess. Um, in the first part, as an analytic, as a, and as a grounded experience of this group of queers of color who live in one household. And then I will sketch in the second part through a, fi a final two vignettes, very brief vignettes, the complex frictive relationship between discourses of fabulosity or fabulousness vis-a-vis -vis the moments and sites of pathos, suffering and struggles of these undocumented immigrants. So my goal here, ultimately, is to offer a way of thinking through the uh, various problematics in queer theory and queer studies, and as well as uh, you know, social justice studies, I would, I would say, in terms of resistance, the, these binaries called, um, such as resistance versus complicity, normativity versus anti-normativity, death and aliveness, suffering and happiness. So let me just deal with the ethnographic background. Um, I call the six people, the six people, the six undocumented immigrants, the queer six. 
Now, people have asked me if there was some symbolism behind it, like the Chicago 7 or whatever. It's like, no. I just, it just came out uh, that way. Um, I first was introduced to this group by their informal leader, a Filipina trans woman named Imelda. I was appalled and shocked when, you know, when Imelda showed me the apartment and opened the door by the uncomfortable and dingy atmosphere of the small, of the small dwelling. This household of six people included Imelda, two South Asian gay men, and I use gay and other identity markers here uh, very loosely and contingently, an Ecuadorian lesbian and two Colombians, a lesbian and bisexual man. All six are immigrants that I eventually confirmed through several years that they were all undocumented, or as some of them say, illegal, a word that they didn't use lightly, but they used nevertheless. Um, the South Asian men were mutual friends, or were the two Colombians, but their common uh, acquaintance, if you will, or the, the instigator of this, this household, how this ho household came together, um, was uh, Imelda. This very un HGTV, this home garden television arrangement, um, in this very small, as I, and I keep saying New York City apartment because I think you need to understand New York City is not like what you see in Friends. You know, the, the movies that are these lofts, these very spacious lofts. Having lived in New York City, I understand what a one bedroom means. It means a closet and a small space that most people would think is, uh, you know, the size of their bathrooms, right? That's a one bedroom apartment. So there is a kind of dif differential scale that I'm talking about here, but to put six people there who are technically unrelated is, is actually quite interesting. So when, um, when Imelda first opened the door, I said, oh my God, I'm in a house of hoarders, right? And, but after years of observing their daily lives, I realized um, that the necessary camp conditions come with the contingencies that they, and, and challenges they, that they live. Um, and I've come to appreciate and complicate the meanings of hoarding, mess, and queerness. The queer six, just to give you an idea, all had, like most working class undocumented immigrants, would have multiple jobs, very contingent jobs that um, were, you know, uh, a couple months, uh, were un um, under the table, if you will, or, um, um, and so they would have di di uh, different work schedules. So it, what was fascinating about going into their house, someone was always sleeping, right? Uh, because they would have these round-the-clock schedule that people would come and go. Um, there would be, there were no beds or tables. There were chairs that were usually folded, piles of clothes in boxes, garbage bags, and suitcases filling the room. So when they slept, they put cushions or blankets over boxes or suitcases in the parts of the room. So the rooms, they, people say, well, there is a bedroom. No, there is no bedroom. It's just spaces for, for which they can put their belongings in, right? So the kitchen, which technically was a space to the right of the main living area, had a non-functioning stove and refrigerator, which was, again, never used except to store water and medicine, because no one actually ever cooked in the house. Um, and they rarely, if ever, and at one time, I, and I document this in another piece, when they actually ate together, it was you know, by accident, they couldn't go out, it was a snowstorm and all that, right? Um, for fear of um, infestation, for, and for the lingering smell of food in their clothes and their bodies. They worked to both send money home and to pull their finances to come up with the monthly rent. Sometimes not everyone would be able to give their share, monthly share, but the shortfall was always with some minor gripes covered by someone else doing better at that, at that time. Due to time constraints, I'll be unable to instantiate, except towards the end of this pres presentation, the uneasy choreography of bodies, the various ways in which seemingly worthless, tacky, if not trashy objects are valued, the curbing of sensorial appetites, you know, the way you can go through your work or even sleep when other, someone is snoring or folding clothes and all, because it is a very cramped space. The choreography is really about how do you maneuver, if you've ever seen piles of clothes, how do you maneuver and create a path ac across these big, if you will, islands and, and bunches of clothes, right? So what I'm uh, suggesting is that these 
this curbing of sensorial capacities, the awkward and uncomfortable gestures, feelings, and affects are, in fact, various ways to think about ordinary habits, rituals, and things as potent sources of insight about objection and marginality. The queer six inhabit a, a space of waywardness in terms of physical, affective, and social disarrangement. Messy or mess is the word that comes up in describing this immigrant household. But I would argue mess is a word that cre can create, eliminate the idea of queerness in general, and to some extent, late capitalist life. My assertion of queer as mess takes off from the initial impulse that propelled the contemporary reappropriation of queer. In his introduction to Fear of Queer Planet, Michael Warner famously likened the project of queer theory in terms of a sensorial morass. That is, queer studies should create a funky atmosphere um, in an otherwise staid and sterile acad uh, academia by making it stink of sexual rut. Such a messing up impulse reverberates in the kinds of queer scholarship that focus on the recognition and countering of uh, under-recognized practices, stances, and situations that deviate from, resist, or run counter to the workings of normality. Queer as mess also, at least from my own study of it, takes its inspiration from the reality television show, uh, from reality television, particularly makeover show. And I'm not sure if you actually have a. I keep thinking, kind of. What not to wear? Do you guys have it? Okay. Because I remember uh, I, one of my biggest movies in Canada in a formal conference, I gave the plot of the final episode of the final episode of, um, of Sex in the City. And, uh, and it, it happened a few weeks after I was writing. And everyone just kept shouting. I said, no! And I said, what did I do? We haven't seen it yet. I said, OK. So I'll try to, to be careful this time. So what not to wear? What not to wear? And, and you do have hoarders buried alive, yes? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. <sighs> so, um, so as you know, what, uh, what not to wear is purported to um, ambush unsuspecting fashion victims and transform them into chic fashionistas. Hoarders buried alive is a different kind of intervention show, also a makeover show in many ways, that seek to literally and metaphorically clean up the lives of hoarders who inhabit crowded and decrepit abodes. In both shows, these reality makeover shows, revolve around the, the narrative of normalization, right? All of them. I mean, both of them, in fact. The fashion makeover shows it's literally they take women, and they're mostly women, right? There's one or two shows that are about men. It's mostly women. Um, uh, who take women who either dress too butch or masculine or who look too slutty in their everyday lives and reform them into proper female subjects. Similarly, the horror show is a lesson on proper domesticity and the ways in which normative value is held as key to propelling the movement from pathology. You know, they always say, oh my God, look at this hoarder um, pathological subject into normality, right? That, that's the, the movement. You go from, uh, in, in the fashion show, you go from the slutty to the proper, right? From uh, uh, the pathological to well-functioning, if you will. But I'm not interested in diagnosing any of the, of the queer six as hoarders. Rather, um, I, I take a more than a visceral interest in the Hoarder Show, which provides indirect yet vital lessons about queer immigrant lives and, the queer, and of queers of color who do not measure up to the lives and metrics of the new valiant citizens of, of gay marriage America, you know, after Obergefell. To go a, a, bit, a bit deeper into rea the, the reality show Hoarders, each story of the Hoarder episode, each Hoarder episode, always almost always start from the point of impossibility and untenability. Basically, as you might have seen, it's always this, this dramatic scene of a, 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 a mother, a friend, uh, a, a child coming into the hoarder's house and saying, how can you, meaning the hoarder, how can you live like this? This is an impossible situation. So from that moment is the thing that propels the, the whole narrative, right? That moment when the hoarder is, is that you, you are living 
an impossible life. It is untenable, right? This impossibility founded on material conditions per that persist in the chaotic, dirty, trashy, disgusting, and crowded living condition of the hoarder is in fact the, the very, um, the, the fuel uh, at, that animate the show's narrative. Um, so this moment of impossibility becomes a catalyst for a planned intervention by a makeover crew, including a mental, uh, mental health worker, a social worker, a professional organizer, and a team of cleaners, movers, um, and uh, cleaners and movers. Impossibility and mess, in my view, are not the turning point to normality, but are in fact the very stuff of queerness. Impossibility and mess are not pathology, but rather productive orientation towards bodies, objects, are, are, and ideas that to, do not toe the line of hygiene, practicality, or functionality, proper capitalist value, and respectable space-time coordination. In several episodes of the show, you, during the cleanup, the hoarder is made to evaluate, okay, which of this stuff do you keep? Which one do you donate? Which ones do you? throw away, right? And that whole exercise is, in fact, an, a re-inculcation of proper capitalist value, right? What are the things that you can sell or what, what are the things that you can exchange, if you will? So the, sh the show argues that the capacity to assess and possess normative capitalist, uh, capitalist value, valuation, is precisely the crucial thing missing in the hoarder's life and a skill that he or she should learn as part of the therapeutic cleanup. The movement from pathology to normality, from impossibility to tenability, from mess to order, can also be portrayed in terms of what can be seen as a teleological route of value, right? It becomes a, a, a kind of a, a, a telos. The ethnographic observation I offer in, a few min in the next few minutes will engage with and refuse such routes of value. But far from being merely positioned as simply renegade or anti-normative, mess actually is enmeshed, or as Karen Thompson elegantly put it, um, mess is awash in, um, in the normative. These refusals emphasize the dynamic role of mess in social life. So in fact, one of the things I'm going to say again and again is that the normative and the queer, the mess and um, do you will, the cleanness are never just these antip uh, antipodal uh, nodes that are separate from each other. Apart from Warner, uh, Michael Warner's explicit renegade posturing of mess and sensorial chaos, mess can be seen in the very semantic and practical locations um, of, of the word and of the term in uh, spheres of social life. Let's take the colloquial term hot mess. So and so is a hot mess. Like if you look at the Urban Dictionary, they'll give you a definition of hot mess, it's, which actually is fascinating. It's a statement that most people will easily categorize as always already pejorative. So you say, I don't want to be a hot mess. Right? That's a hot mess. And yet you realize that in fact, media's treatment of hot messes isn't about a refusal, but in fact a valorization. So you can't, it, 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 and this is something that I, because I, I do a lot of uh, studies around the senses, the disgusting and the things that you, uh, um, the things that are horrible are not things that you just say, oh, I don't want to see that, but you keep turning back and looking back and looking back, right? So um, consider the rather slippery and erratic judgments of entertainment figures such as Amanda Bynes, Lindsay Lohan, Britney Spears, and how such judge, by the way, are very gendered, right? But are never static, right? They're never static, and they're never meant to be, because hot messes, precisely because they are lab labeled uh, hot messes, are at least ideally are meant to at least go through a different route. Either they persist in this tragic train wreck that uh, people think they are, or that the train wreck would diverge into something more celebratory. And there is that moment where people are like, mm, maybe something will happen. And people are always waiting to happen. It's never static, right? It is still moving. It's not a wreck that's there and that's it. And in fact, even in train wrecks, people cannot restrain themselves from just keeping looking and seeing some kind of movement even within, let's say, a carnage, right? Even at the moment when people um, 
think, oh, this is such a horrible smell, I want to turn away from it, right? It, it, the reason why people, uh, there is that strong, uh, particularly um, uh, strong reaction to messes and disgusting things, precisely its ability to make you think if it's going to overcome you. And, and that fear actually mobilizes rather than immobilize um, things. It doesn't make things static, right? Um, so oftentimes the idea of hot mess involves, as what I'm saying here in, in colloquial terms, it occupies a frictive dimension, friction, like friction, between, that runs simultaneously between positive and negative modes. So it's never just negative, right? It's just a no. It's never just a no. There's always this possibility of like turning and, and doing something, gliding, creating strains, um, straining, opening various kinds of potential action, acknowledging various marginal forms of value and of moral and, um, and, uh, and of the moral and the ethical. So as I will allude to later, the notion of hot mess, or as I earlier mentioned, there is that strong gender dynamic to this enduring colloquial uses of mess. So you have these kinds of ideas of mess, because people always say, oh, I know what mess is. But actually, mess is so multivalent, right? But think of recent literature coming from um, social science and the philosophy of social science and the management of, uh, of systems, both business and uh, kind of engineering systems. And they have very interesting things to say about mess. In the two bodies of literature, in the, you know, from science and technology, philosophy of scientific method and all that, um, uh, John Law, who is a technical sociologist and a philosopher, uh, men mentioned that um, mess is in fact um, mess is in fact a, a useful category. It's not an aberration. He suggests that um, the the penchant for creating neat analytical categories and routine regularities is is in fact the the very uh, is is something that we need to get away from. Right? That social researchers should look to mess and messiness as a way to more accurately and sensitively portray everyday social interaction and institutions. Um, the, uh, re the recent literature on the management of systemic crisis, especially those that seek to administer, administer complex circuits and systems such as urban transport, em emergency and disaster services, and other administrative units, Trenchantly suggests that messes should not be considered as always already bad or negative or actually outside the system, but actually part of it, right? So we'd like to think that oh, a properly functioning system is a system without mess. But then ma management science is now saying, well, no, you always have to think that mess is in the system, that it's possible that uh, it's, it's a it's an important consideration of thinking of systems. It's not anti-systemic, it's actually part of the system, right? So here I'm, I'm suggesting the various ways to, um, to think of mess as, uh, as a way of, uh, of potentially thinking of it as a productive analytic. So one of the things that I'm trying to do here as a way to um, schematically present to you is that mess is a vantage or a window to various interconnected and shifting levels, instances, moments, situations, scales, and tensions in everyday life. And um, as I mentioned earlier, mess is also multivalent, like hot mess. Affected messes that involves atmospheres and ecologies of discrepant feelings, affects, emotions, bodies, objects that precipitate and necessitate particular energies composures, bodily composures, stances, and movements around survival. There are gendered messes, like hot messes, uh, where male and female nodes are seen in terms of normative, non-normative logics, hysteria and order, male and female. Um, not so much in a, but again, these strict by, uh, I, I'm not suggesting they are strict by them, but rather are always in these conflicting tensions of attraction, repulsion, pathology and normalization. I think of queer immigrants in particular, and immigrants in general, uh, in terms of how they historically and socially have been popularly uh, rendered as gendered, sexualized 
deviance. Then there are political, economic, and financial messes, such as the undocumented status, right? When people say you're undocumented, it's actually a fascinating category to understand and to look into. It is not the lack of document, right? It's actually a messy, and, and this is the way some of the career six will actually talk about their situation. It's, it's not because they don't lack, they have documents. They're not the right the document according to the, um, the state. But what the state does in many ways is, is it creates this, um, this uh, category of the undocumented as precisely uh, people who, um, who have a mess of papers, right? That, um, that the undocumented status is precisely something that, uh, uh, that does not conform to a kind of organized uh, set of, of identity papers. The other point of uh, thinking about, let's say, economic messes, living from paycheck to paycheck, uh, not having a credit card, undocumented immigrants, a career six in particular, talk about how <clears throat> they have to pull in their resources. Not having a credit card does not make you a good capitalist citizen, right? And does not make you a good gay citizen because you don't consume, right? So in many ways, these messes are uh, of different levels, right? Um, they're bad citizens, both of the gay LGBT community, if you want more to talk about it, bad citizens of the nation or non-citizens of the nation and bad citizens of capitalism. And then, of course, we have the physical and object messes uh, that include ways in which um, objects are disarranged and do not conform to particular domestic and aesthetic orders. And one of the things I try to do in um, other parts of the, the project is to think ab about how, um, and I think I, I, I mentioned this in the, uh, my radical history chapter, um, essay, not chapter, radical history essay, where um, one of them saw these plates, these melamine plates, you know, those plates that are not China, but they're breakable. You've seen those? Um, actually, my father loved those. They, they thought that was uh, the height of Americana, <laughs> something that was, not China, uh, that was not porcelain, but was not plastic. But, um, but what was fascinating was that how one of the career six found them on, on, the, um, on, the, on the sidewalk, and they were like, oh my god, this is so beautiful, right? I've always wanted a set. They were missing, you know, uh, they, were, uh, they were not complete, if you will. Um, but what was fascinating precisely was, A, they will never use them because they don't eat, right? They don't eat at home and they would never know. And precisely they were heavy that if they needed to do, and these people have a long history of moving from one place to the other in, 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 a, in, in a flash, especially if they're being evicted and they've been evicted so many times and they're in what they call an illegal lease. Only one person holds the lease, right? So for them to actually have the stack of dishes that they valued and they, they were ooing and aahing, I was like, why? And then I realized precisely the ways in which the, it's not just about the stacking of objects and how um, uh, they might not be aesthetically pleasing, at least to an outsider's eye, but for, for someone to say, this is someone, I, this is something I found and I value it for this moment, even without its functional value, is, is something to um, consider. So just, just to kind of pull things together, what I'm putting forward is that mess is not a static state of being, but rather a constellation of shifting, tense-filled conditions that mobilize thought and action. Mess is a pool of meanings that we are not just mired in, but rather that which we need to swim, navigate, negotiate, contest, and live with in order to survive. Therefore, one way to think about mess and, and about queer and the relationship between the two is to think of them as a process that does not exist does not exist outside normality, but rather is constitutive of it. But while at the same time, queerness promises potential routes to alternative forms of being and dwelling. And here goes the idea of 
the fabulous, right? So on the one hand, people are saying, well, so are you just celebrating mess, right? Is this just all about let's embrace the dirt and embrace the mess? But I think here, I think, is where I talk about fabulosity. And this is where fabulosity comes traipsing in. What is the promise of mess? Beyond embracing it, I think, in the case of the queer six, um, beyond the pathos, suffering, bare life, and impossibility, I go back to the idea that mess enables particular modes of potential routes of action, thoughts, and feelings. Instead of seeing the queer six as wallowing, merely, as they say, wallowing, and I, and I, took, I take wallowing, uh, again, as something more productive than what people might want, uh, might uh, give it. Um, wallowing in the, in the mess, we could think about how such engagement in everyday life, even as people wallow, also entail moments of exuberance, aliveness, and pleasure. So let me give you two brief vignettes of Imelda and um, you know, the intrepid informal leader of the group and Natalia, the Ecuadorian les lesbians. First, Imelda, this is a, a story, this is a, a, um, a scene from one of my uh, observations. Imelda, after working 12 days straight, found herself alone with me in the apartment. She took a glass someone in the household um, has placed in one of the counters and placed two flowers filched from the neighborhood park. Imelda took the flowers and emptied the glass of water. She walked gingerly across a small path between the mountains of bags and boxes in the room. She carried the two boxes as if they were part of a bouquet and the glass, and holding the glass like it was a trophy. And looking towards something in the ceiling and as if talking to a microphone, she proudly stood with her hand, uh, hand akimbo and her feet solidly on the ground. Imelda, Miss America of Jackson Heights. Second, the second story, uh, vignette, if you want. Natalia, uh, um, the, the Ecuadorian, was ecstatic one day when she saw me. She had a brown package, and she said it contained a perfume that her employer, a rich Wall Street executive, had given her. She was a, a, a part-time uh, maid. Sometimes she was a live-in maid, and then later on, was more, um, uh, had a more flexible arrangement, if you will. So what the perfume was, was a bath splash. It was, again, I'm talking about a brand, Jeanneté. Have you seen this? It's like a bath splash. You can buy it in like big, big bottles in a drugstore. It's like very lemony. <laughs> anyway, sorry, it's Jeanneté. And the reason why I say this, because, um, it, it wasn't perfume, it was a splash, but she kept saying perfume, so I said, okay, perfume. But it was one of the, you know, uh, drugstore, bath splash kind of thing. And she, uh, she, she said that she, uh, she kept putting it on uh, her body after showering, which is what people usually do. And a few weeks later, she said that the scent of Jeanneté, that cheap splash, uh, bath splash from, uh, that you can buy from any pharmacy or drugstore was so magical. She said the smell of dust and bodies in the apartment disappeared and made her feel like she was in a garden, a European manicured garden with hedges. It reminded her of gardens back home in her native Ecuador and also a, a section of Central Park. She, she said it made her forget the narrow cramped surroundings and made her think of open spaces. Now, how do we app apprehend these two moments? Can we think of them as being fabulous or just examples of pathetic hot messes? But before I can respond to this query, I would like to present the formulation of the fabulous and fabulosity, a good part of which I derived, I, I recently read the works of um, uh, the performance theorist Madison Moore, and I realized a lot of the things I've been saying, he's been saying first. So <laughs> I would like to say that um, you know, there's this, this kind of convergence. First, I'd like to think of fabulous not so much as the commodified and valorized um, set of brand names and expensive objects that people consume, but rather as a messy assemblage of objects, gestures, desires, and atmosphere. Let me take it more, more closely by, use, by looking at the word fabulosity. 
Oh, um, actually, we're fine. Um, fabulosity actually is um, is a it's attributed to and it's trademarked by the fashion maven, lifestyle icon, erstwhile reality star and former model, Kimora Lee Simmons, whose initial claim to fame was being the wife of a media, media mogul, Russell Simmons, and who herself was quite a famous fashion model. It's based on a, some, a seemingly elitist notion of being sexy, elegant, and attractive. While the Urban Dictionary spells out a very democratic definition of fabulosity, quote unquote, a state of everything that is fabulous. <laughs> very, very useful definition. <laughs> or a quality ascribed to that which expresses glamour, style, charisma, power, and heart. Simmons' reality show, which is now canceled, um, clothing companies, philosophical music, including those in her authored book, Fabulosity, What It Is and How to Get It, um, that you can get on Amazon for $5, I think. Um, <laughs> strongly imply that only a select few can acquire fabulosity through consumptive practices and material and symbolic success. But while, on the one hand, I do derive some ironic inspiration from Simmons' diva philosophy of life, which combines consumption with the creation of, as she says, inner strength by women, and more importantly, her notion of being fabulous as influenced by American urban street culture, so much so that Fabulous on Rodeo Drive or Madison Avenue, with a Fabulosity um, uh, touch, is just a few steps away from the ghetto. Hence the moniker, moniker Ghetto Fabulous. However, I still depart from her limited notion, and I attempt to flex, distort, extend, and give muscle to the notion of Fabulosity as constituted by embodied moments of pleasure, ethical self-making um, that are linked to but partially emergent from the dirt, grime, chaos, and ruliness of day-to-day -day living. Fabulosity, I, um, I, I would argue, is about the sporadic, reflective moments of pleasurable and exuberant bodily awareness and of affective conditions messed up and funked up with feelings, memories, and realities of hardship, bitterness, insignificance, and loss. So in fact, fabulosity is never clean, right? It's always messy. Fabulosity is multidimensional. It is performative. It's an ethical self-making process. And it's an act of storytelling. So let me uh, parse that a little bit. Fabulosity is performative, like singing a song, singing the nation, in the manner that Spivak and Bogler talked about in performing singing of the nation as a claiming of public space and recognition by immigrants. I think of fabulosity as bodily performance of claiming both public and private spaces, of selves submerged in the cruel weight of quotidian struggles. It is an act of, of making a self through one's body that um, that's on the one hand, that is, uh, on the one hand, visually and affectively arresting a spectacle, if you will, or what Madison Moore terms as fierceness that coming from house and voguing culture. Firstness, which is a disruptive strategy of self-presentation that demands to be acknowledged the second it is experienced. The um, key to the light of the fact that bodies at the margins, any margins, are regularly invisible and somewhat on the outskirts of normalcy and social convention." End quote. But I would add that it's not completely divorced. Again, even as Madison Moore there's observations of voguing cultures of peop uh, people in the streets that sometimes, you know, the performances I'm really talking about are performances that do not have actual audience. There is no returning of the gaze, right? There is no, um, th there's no visible, I'm performing for you, but mo most of the time it's performing for oneself, right? Um, but nevertheless, they're still useful. Um, so that it's never completely divorced from the everyday, but gliding, grading, and, uh, and gaining traction from it. While Moore suggests that it's um, the otherworldly, non-normative, alien, mythical self-making and capti captivating quality of the fabulous is because it is out of bounds, uh, out of, I'm sorry, out of the bounds of the acceptable, but also, I, I may add, it is out of bounds of the possible and the rational. At the same time, I think about fabulosity and being fabulous as never completely visual, as I was talking about. 
so that there are these other sensorial registers that come with uh, Fabulous, because Fabulous in the way most people think about, and I think Mazin Moore, is, is there's the visuality that there is this gaze, this kind of ocular-centric notion of fabulous is something that I kind of move, uh, moving a, a, a bit away from, right? Fabulosity is part of ethical self-making or self-invention in a Foucauldian care of the self, a creation of self that's not just a merely mere routine performance of bodily dispositions, but a moment of creating and reala realizing a self Despite, exist being, um, despite existing and surviving on the fringes of low pay, the drudgery of public transportation, inhabiting um, dingy apartments. So think about the ways in which, again, the queer six are trying to come together, however informally, to survive, pay the rent and all that, to be quiet while someone is sleeping, to move one's body across a crowded, cramped room without bumping into each other or displacing the mountains of possessions in the two, two rooms of the apartment. Again, these multiple sensorial registers. Lastly, taking the various etymological roots of the word fabulous, such as fable and fabula, I suggest that fabulosity is about story making and narration. The act of narrating selves amidst the forms of contingency, it is precisely these stories of fabulosity that constitute one major aspect of the lives of the queer six, whose stories abound in, amounts, in moments of exuberance, such as, such as the two vignettes I talked about, of Imelda as Miss America of Jackson Heights, or the imagined gardens of Natalia. These moments of exuberance do, do in part relocate these queer subjects into imagined locales, but never completely breaking the bonds and binds of their everyday realities. Their emplacements and relocations are never complete. They are fierce and fabulous precisely because they are still aware of where they live, where they are, and who they are. Imelda is a Miss America who is of and from Jackson Heights, a working class immigrant neighborhood um, that is on the throes of uh, gentrification. Um, while Natalia revels in imagined perfumed gardens borne by nostalgic memories of home and the materiality of a cheap drugstore perf um, scent, while acknowledging such sensorial dissonance with the reality of living in a small cramped apartment. Again, I can't just tell you, I, you know, I, I don't have pictures, again, pictures won't do justice, nor do I have smell of vision, right, in the ways in which, um, again, it's not just the visual, to kind of think about the weight of, the, of, of um, the atmosphere, right, um, on, on their, uh, the, and the way they, they narrate their lives and they see themselves, right? It is this insistence on the experience of other places, times and places, the recalcitrance recalcit 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 to just settle in, to engage in the duress of living as an undocumented working class immigrant, it is to more specific ways to value and appreciate things and situations that open up narrow, cramped notions of the good life and to turn to what um, uh, George Perec calls the infraordinary, the small, the insignificant, as a way to think through the enmeshments of happiness and suffering, normativity queer, death and aliveness, complicity and resistance, because a lot of people just think, oh, they're in this, living in this mess, and by the way, one of the, the, sub, um, the subtitle of the hoarder show is uh, Buried Alive. So there's a sense in which hoarder is a, a kind of death, not a, a, not a way of life, right? So that having these kinds of domest domestic disarrangement is death, and I'm arguing, in fact, the opposite, right? That it is a way of life, and so, so, in the end, as I say, fabulosity itself, as I mentioned before, is messy it's, it, and never complete. So a way of concluding, what I've attempted to offer today is this, that the idea of mess, that, that, that mess provides a vibrant analytical and phenomenological grip on the exigencies of marginalized queers, especially those who do not occupy the valorized homonormative spaces of the global north. They're not good gay, lesbian, LGBT citizens. 
Next is the possible route for funking up and mobilizing new understandings of stories, values, objects, and space-time arrangement. Queer as mess offers a notion of queer that is not pure, but rather always alloyed or enmeshed or awash in the greedy chaos of the everyday. Queer as mess gives flesh to bare life in ways that cannot be adequately accounted for by abstract account. The elegant traipsing of Imelda across the domestic threshold of disorder and discomfort and Natalia's imagined perfumed gardens in a domicile of sensorial morass showcase how the infraordinary, the submerged understandings and body stances embedded firmly in the uncomfortable, the wayward, the off-kilter, the messy, and the queer are ways to imagine and dwell otherwise. Thank you. We have just about five minutes. Sorry about that. Uh, I'll get Martin, can you moderate? Sure. <coughs> sure. I'm sorry, I tried to cut down. I was cutting as I was going along. That was a hot mess. That was a hot mess. <laughs> I think some, somebody said, how do I assess the messiness of an essay with, when someone was reviewing an essay about mess? That's messy, but it's about mess. <laughs> you can. <All> right. <laughs> yes. Mary. Yeah. The dirt is matter out, out of place. place. And it seems to me that there are three elements to this. One would be contingency, another would be materiality, and then there's this element which interests me a great deal in relation to your work, which I would call, I don't know, realism or some kind of commitment to the actual. Mm -hmm. And so I would love to hear just a few words from you about your continued engagement in ethnographic practice and mm -hmm. how it is that you work in some way, how do you locate your ethnographic practice in terms of a real or an actual? Um, well, the real, the truth. I've just been reading, rereading John Law. It is about a constant production of realities, right? That when I talk to people, I don't, I don't elicit, so this is something for later on the work method thing. Uh, when I talk to people, it's not to get data to construct my construction of the realities. I see them as always constructing these realities. They're, they're, they're never just, and I, because there, there's just that tension, and I, and I know you're not you're kind of pointing it to it, to it too, because there's a way in which an engagement, ethnographic engagement, particularly with interviewing, can be a way of cleaning up. And I'm trying hard not to clean up. It's very hard, because people will say, well, what do you ultimately mean, right? Um, so ethnography is messy. It's messy method, which is why a lot of social scientists think, oh, yeah, it's fine, it's soft. They say it's a soft social science, not like economics, mm -hmm. right? It's, you know, you can hold on to it. But my engagement is precisely not holding on to it too tightly. So when I listen to people, I let it, I just go, oh, I'm not exactly sure what that means. And sometimes, even after I've written it, and then I read it again, I'm like, Oh, I really should have gone a, a, a different way, but I'm okay with that. And I used to be like, as a grad student, I need to be, go one, two, three, this is what they meant, as if interpretation is, you know, unraveling and showing these are the layers and therefore this is what the meaning is. But it is about just letting go and letting it be. And, and sometimes it runs counter to the idea of, let's say, a book or a good essay. People say, well, wait a minute. So how come this, this is counterintuitive? And does this kind of comes, rubs against what you're trying to say? And I guess one of the things I'm trying to do, 
and to be more skillful at showing that, right? Because ethnography is precisely, uh, and one's engagement with it is, uh, is not, because a lot of people think, oh, it's just interviewing people. If you interview people, it's like journalism, who, what, when, where, right? But it's not that. And a lot of it is precisely the, those other things, the, the kind of, the weight that you can't actually just put into very clear cut words or phrases, right? That sometimes poetry might be, that's why some ethnographers turn to poetry uh, uh, because of nuances of it. But I guess part of it has to do with this idea of, of holding it and allowing it to maybe it will flutter away Maybe it's so fragile, just even without touching it, it will crash. And that, to me, is are the stories. It's not the hard data. It's not the, uh, you know, the who, what, when, where of someone's story, but are the moments. People always say, well, why don't you just tell us who they are, what happened to them? People always say, so what happened to them? People always are like, so they, this bad, and by the way, they did this bad, right? And people are just like, well, oh, why even tell us that story if they disbanded? And I'm thinking, what did you expect of that story? People's expectations of stories. And, and because people always say, oh, you'll give us a good story. I said, what well, is a good story, right? And I'm, I'm, I'm now more open to the fact that the stories may never be good in that sense, right? That, that they, they talk about what? Do they say to you as someone visiting, excuse the mess, or is it not something that... Well, you know, they exactly? first were very... Uh, oh, it's messy. It's, uh, you know, they, they... I guess from other, other people's reaction, they say... Uh, and, and, and Imela did say, you know, it's, we're a little crowded. And she was trying to say something. I said, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. Just, and she opened it up, I'm like... And I guess she saw that reaction. But... Um, <laughs> but but one thing that was really interesting is that after a while, and this is the best thing about ethnography, it's not what you, you know, derive in these systematic, oh, tell us, tell us this. It's actually just being there, right? And, and, and there allows for that kind of what Heidegger uh, calls a kind of attunement for the moods. I, I think he calls it mood. It is about the mood. It's not about, oh, so-and-so did this and did that, and now he's in this. It's actually not that. It is, it is to me, this, this kind of, and, and that's why people think it's me, the method is messy. Mm -hmm. Because it doesn't, it, um, because I remember working for um, uh, a research department, and they were peopled by quantitative people, uh, quantitative um, scholars, <laughs> as they said. <laughs> so I came back with my ethnography, and they said, hmm. They're paragraphs. And I said, yes. <laughs> and they wanted me to, to uh, code them. And I said, code them? But you know, you create categories. And then from those categories, you code those yeah. stories. And then it'll be, and I used the word, and I didn't uh, say it. He did. He said, it'll be pretty. I said, pretty? Yes, because you'll see the numbers, the number of times. Then the data is pretty. But it's really a, 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 an interesting mindset that people in quantitative uh, social sciences will look at it and they say, oh, it's a mess. And they actually do say mess. Uh, but, but to go back to the, the career six, they, there was that moment where they just said, yeah, this is how we live. You know? There was that moment when, uh, that one time where they actually ate. And they were like, wow, this is unusual, blah, blah, blah. And they were, at least comfortable, right? I mean, there's a reason why it's not just this one time, let's sit down and let, tell me your life story, but rather this moment of, of taking in uh, not so much words, but how people move around and, and uh, you know, interact with each other, interact with you. Not to say that people just thought of, uh, thought of me as one of them, because I was never really one of them. 
uh, my discomfort was not the same as their discomfort. I'm sure there's a lot of my discomfort that I impute to them at some point, right? Um, but you know, one of the things so I use the word discomfort once, and they say, "Yeah, you know, but we learn to get, get to see which discomforts you can live with or which discomfort you need to change." But uh, to me, I was just like, "Oh, uncomfortable." But to them, they have these gradations or scales, if you will, of, of, of discomfort. To me, it was just one big discomfort. I go and I'm like, oh. You know, imagine me being that relative or well-being relative in the horror show. Say, how can you live like this? And how, how do we start you know, thinking through that impossibility? And, um, and, and, to, and it's my, the answer isn't so much asking them, so how do you live? But they show it that they live despite and through those different things, like the, the mess, right? So we are past one. Um, so I'd like to, I think we need to adjourn. I'm just going to take a time. So thank you. Thank Mark. you very much. Thank you.